just give it a bit more time for everybody to come in. I hope you're having a lovely afternoon and it's really sunny here. I think we're going to be all over the country today, so that's um, really great. Good, just seeing more people coming in, making sure you... Wonderful. Got more people coming in, which is good. Give it another minute or so. So we're on about 31 participants now, which is good. Okay, we'll make a start. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to the Screen Skills Select RTS Scotland Industry Insight session on film and TV roles and hair and makeup. My name is Victoria Trach and I'm Accreditation Programme Manager at Screen Skills. Today we'll be diving into hair and makeup roles in film and TV with industry practitioners at different stages in their careers, discussing their current roles and previous projects they've worked on. Please note that we're going to be recording this session. There will be a Q&A towards the end of the session, so please submit any questions you have via the Q&A feature. It would be helpful if you could mention who the question is for when submitting these, and the question will be put to the um, panel during the last 15 minutes of the session. So Screen Skills is a national skills body for the screen industries. We provide targeted support to retain and build a skilled and inclusive workforce critical to the screen industry's global success work across the UK to ensure that film, TV, visual effects, animation and games have the skills and talent they need. We identify skills gaps and shortages across the screen industries, support and quality mark education and training, and offer professional development opportunities in screen. I manage the Screen Skills Select Endorsement Scheme, which endorses and enhances screen courses that develop industry-ready students. By identifying the UK's most industry-focused courses, we enable employers to recruit the best talent. The Royal Television Society for Scotland is an educational charity promoting the art, science and craft of television and schedule informative events all year round on a host of different topics, from their annual Scotland Awards and Student Awards to the prestigious Campbell Swinton Lectures, plus other events relevant to Scotland's television industry, featuring Scottish production teams and programmes, or tackling issues impacting television production and broadcast in Scotland. So let me hand you over to Liz Tagg, who is Principal at the Ivor Makeup Academy, which is based at Pinewood Studios. Um, Liz will be facilitating this session and we'll introduce you to each of the industry speakers. And I really, really hope you enjoy this session. So thank you. Over to you, Liz. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, my name's Liz Tagg. Um, I started my career as a hair, makeup and SFX artist back in 1984. And I've worked on numerous television and film projects over the years. I'm also the principal at the Ivor Makeup Academy based at Pinewood Studios. We hope that today's session will give you a greater insight into the roots into the career, the various roles in the makeup and hair and SFX departments, and how to progress through your career. In my career, I've worked in many different roles within the makeup department, working as a makeup and hair assistant, artist, crowd makeup supervisor, and also a hair and makeup designer. Now, obviously, the start of my career was a long time ago, 40 years to be precise. Times have changed, but it's very important for you to know that even today, all makeup artists start at the bottom of the career ladder as a trainee makeup and hair artist. Once you have gained this vital experience, you can start working your way up to makeup junior, assistant, artist, supervisor and designer. One of the many attributes of a makeup artist is to be very versatile, adaptable and resilient. We can film up a mountain in hundreds of layers of thermals and huge coats and deal with the problems of sticking beards on actors with frozen glue and frozen fingers or working a night shoot in the rain looking after hundreds of extras and still be professional and smiling at 4am. Whatever the locations or challenges that we've thrown at you in your career as a makeup artist, the most important aspect to consider is that this job, you can spend all day, every day doing something that you love and getting paid for it. There are many mediums to work in as a makeup artist, from fashion to theatre to TV and film. In today's session, we will be concentrating on the makeup and hair and SFX department roles in film and high-end TV. There is a general structure to most departments, though some can vary, especially on the larger budget productions, 
uh, with teams being split out into makeup department, hair department, SFX department, and of course, with A-listers bringing in their personal teams. However, around 80% of high-end TV and film shot in the UK will follow the structure that we'll be talking about today. So it may help you to know a little bit more about these roles and the career progression. Thought I'd give you a brief, brief description of each role from entry level, from trainee entry level through to designer. And then you can hear directly from the panel about their day-to-day -day experiences in these roles. So the um, starter position is the trainee makeup artist. It's a vital position of any film. You will be supporting the makeup team with the makeup such as dirtying down, looking after background artists, removal of prosthetics and SFX. Also, you, you could assist the designer or artist with complicated hairstyles by passing them pins and grips or rollers and hot sticks, watching and learning all the time, as well as organizing paperwork such as timesheets, petty cash, and all importantly, the continuity file. A film trainee should expect to work for about two years before moving up to junior role, probably another two years from junior to makeup artist, but this can vary from between individuals. The junior role is the level up from trainee. You may often have to support the team with dressing and applying wigs for the stunt team and actors doubles. You may be expected to create a character hair and makeup look on an actor or supporting artist. Depending on your hair experience, you would be required to, to cut hair. Another vital role of a junior hair and makeup artist is supporting the department with their admin tasks, such as ordering stock, organizing fittings and crowd rooms. I do know juniors in film who are very happy to stay in their position for longer than two years. On high-end TV and film, you will be on a, you'll be earning back two rates and gaining experience without the pressure that comes from being a fully fledged makeup artist. You can imagine that it's really daunting experience to see a close up of your makeup and hair on an actor on a huge 20 meter high cinema screen in Leicester Square. You want to be confident of your abilities for that. When you're ready to move up to makeup artists, this requires skill, speed, and confidence. The craft skills required for this role are extensive and the job can be high pressured as when working with actors and celebrities, soft skills are essential. Although the artist will always follow the brief from the makeup and hair designer, they're responsible for the character's appearance on screen. You're expected to get your actors ready on time to a high standard. Stand by with them on set while shooting and record images and take notes for continuity. The makeup and hair supervisor role can be split into two subsections. Main team supervisor, who is the right hand of the designer and crowd room supervisor, who is responsible for the background artist fittings and crowd calls. The supervisor can sometimes be in charge of 80 plus artists in a big crowd room. These crowd rooms are run with military precision. Supervisors will liaise with assistant director team to ensure the smooth running of fittings and filming days. The makeup designer role, are the makeup designers on board well ahead of the shooting dates. The designer collaborates with the director, production designer and costume designer to create the designs within the budget allocated. For each character that appears on the screens, wigs, facial hair, prosthetics need to be designed and facilitated. In general, the designer will choose the team, ensuring each member of the department has the correct skills to facilitate the production. On the panel today, we have artists from each level of the department. Miriam Sumere, trainee makeup and hair artist. Georgia Hobbs, makeup artist, prosthetics artist, um, who's done the trainee role, done the junior role, and is now artist role. and just about to move up to do some designing and Jackie Mallet, hair and makeup designer who has been doing the job as long as I have because we trained together. Um, Miriam I'm going to start with you um, and we've, I've got a few questions. One of the biggest questions and the most frequently asked questions I get asked is how do I find work? Could you tell us your journey from graduation, your first steps into the industry and the biggest challenges that you that you came across yeah definitely I mean I think that definitely is the biggest challenge is knowing where to look for your work um it's a very um it's an industry where things aren't always posted online um designers are often talking to the people that they've hired previously or getting references from them 
Um, I think as a trainee, the thing that's going to set you apart is your soft skills um, more than your practical skills. So you need to be a really like personable person, be organized. I think start networking now. Don't wait until you've graduated to try and make those contacts. Um, the people that you're work that you're studying with now are going to be part of your network. I know um my fellow students when I was training got me some jobs on things and I got them jobs. Um WhatsApp groups are really important to be part of. A lot of jobs get posted in there. There's a um, trainee and junior WhatsApp group. Um, and Instagram posts as well sometimes. Um, I know I got my first role by contacting someone on Instagram. Um, I actually assisted them on a music video, which was a little bit different um, before I actually graduated. But then once I did graduate, they were working on a pilot and they um, asked me to join them. It was like a couple of weeks after I graduated. So that was perfect timing to get some experience on TV. And then from then I would work on student films and short films and build up my skills and confidence and portfolio and really just be networking with everyone and utilize your tutors, utilize your fellow students. Um, you've been lucky enough to be part of the Screen Skills Trainee Finder scheme. Can you tell me how that's helped you? That's helped massively in terms of knowing, well, in terms of having the opportunity to apply for productions, because like I said, a lot of stuff isn't posted online. So while you can be sending your CV out to people, it's not necessarily when they're crewing up. Um, you sometimes find out about these opportunities after they've already crewed up. So with the trainee finder, um, you get an email call out saying this production is looking for um, a trainee between the, these dates and these dates. And then you get the opportunity to send your CV. So for me, that's been really helpful. Um, I landed my first one a couple of months after joining the trainee finder and then from then that helped me also get my next placement because the supervisor on my next placement knew the supervisor from my previous one gave them a call and got a reference and so for me personally that's been a massive help are you able to give us a few examples not breaking any ndas of course of productions you've been involved with and yes. if, if you're not allowed to say names, if you can just give us the genres and the kind of thing you did. Yeah, so my first um, film placement that I got via Screen Skills, uh, it was a vampire, modern day vampire film, um, which was an adaptation from a novel. Um, and that was a really fun one to work with because it was modern day. I got to be quite involved in helping out with the hair and makeup, which isn't always necessarily what you'd get to do as a trainee, but it was really fun. There was also some blood involved, which was fun. And it was kind of like a dark comedy. Um, but then my next placement was very different from that. It was a drama based on a true story and it was set between late sixties and late seventies. And so it was really interesting to be able to see how two completely different um, productions work both were only like a couple of months long they were like seven eight week shoots and it's just amazing to see how quickly um you can get like a big film done um yeah and then since then I've just done quite a few dailies on various genres but those were the two main big placements that I've had can you describe a day to day from the minute you walk in in the morning what are some of the first tasks you would be expected to do as the trainee um so the training is usually the first one there you want to make sure that if you're on a makeup bus so if you're on main team that everyone's space is clean and set up and tidy you want to get um your towels into the towel warmer if there is one um make sure that that's all prepped. Always boil the kettle when you first get in as well. <laughs> make sure you're ready to get the teas and coffees. Um, if you need to put out any um, continuity photos, make sure that those are out, any like hair pieces that are needed. You might want to unblock the wigs that are gonna be used for the day. Um, then once everyone's in the chair, you'll be, you might be assisting by passing pins or doing tattoo cover. Um, you'll, depending on the job, that will vary. You'll make sure you go and get everyone's breakfast um, and do teas and coffees. Make sure that the mothership 
bag um, that's taken to set is stocked up. Could um, you please explain? What the <laughs> <is>? <laughs> so it's kind of like a communal set bag in a way with um, in there you should have like lots of your consumables maybe you'll have um some extra hair products or stuff if it's something that involves blood you might have like a little blood bag in there um it's basically just got extras in there um that everybody can use and kind of like your emergency products in case um something gets sprung on you last minute and um the artists don't necessarily have it in their set bag um so as a trainee you just need to keep on top of the stock in that bag, make sure it's easy for everyone to find, everything's labelled. Um, and yeah, so that's part of the duty. And then you'd obviously be getting everybody's lunch. You might be on set helping um, with continuity photos and things like that. Um, or you might be on the bus and um, doing your admin. So this could be like ordering stock or... Um, like updating the continuity files, perhaps helping with like accounts and timesheets and things like that. Um, make sure everything's tidy after the call. And then um, at the end of the day, you might help derig. Um, make sure again, everyone's got their hot flannels. Um, you might be washing hair at the end of the day, cleaning wigs and facial pieces, um, maybe blocking up the wigs, but I would always ask if they want you to block up the wigs because um, some might prefer to do that themselves and yeah that's kind of kind of day to day. And how different is working on the main bus to working in crowd would you say? Um, I would say the main differences are obviously in crowd there's typically a lot more artists um, so that's a lot more people to make sure that you're helping but also that a lot of them will be dailies, so won't necessarily have the context of the wider production and they'll be recreating looks that other artists have made. So I just it's really, really integral to make sure that they've got the right photos, um, if there's any hair pieces or accessories that are used, just to make sure that they've got all of that. And you will probably be the person that they come to to ask all the questions too. So just make sure that you're um, aware of where everything is and not just in terms of like the makeup kit, but in terms of set, they often, they will come to the trainee to ask um, where, where everything is, where they need to be going, etc. cetera. Um, I think also on a makeup bus, that is your home for the entire shoot. There is usually space to be putting everything, but it is very small um, and it's also designed to move. So be um, mindful, especially during the call, um, that you're not walking around too much because it can be jogging the bus and you can can be like getting in the way of um, people as they're working um, but a crowd room if you're that could kind of be anywhere um, <laughs> could be a big tent or a hall or like I've recently been in a science lab <laughs> um, so there's not necessarily a storage for your stuff so you just need to make sure that you're really on top of um, what stock you've got and that it's all organized in um, boxes and just to make sure that you get everything back at the end of the day and you're very aware of where everything is. So there's a, a huge proportion of creative versus admin and organization isn't there in in the trainee and junior role actually and then designer role. What would you say um, the proportion is for creative being creative and admin? in the jobs you've done? Um, I think it varies massively. Um, in the the vampire film, for example, that I was on, I would say that was a bit more 50-50 creative admin, which is, isn't is often the case with um, trainee roles, but there were a few variables with that. Like, for example, there was a junior, so I was able to share some of the ad administrative duties with them. And there was also no crowd team, so they needed me to be a bit more hands-on with helping to get people ready. Um, and it was modern day, whereas the one that I did afterwards was definitely more admin heavy, although I did have um, create, like opportunities to be creative on it as well. Um, but again, that was a period piece, so it's a bit um, more precise, I guess, in some of the looks. Um, there wasn't a junior, so it all fell on me to do the admin and there was a crowd team. 
so it it varies massively but on that I was still doing like helping with tattoo cover and I was making like plastic partings and I did look after some like day players um I'd say the creative element varies more than the admin because every trainee role will have admin duties administrative duties so it's really important to make sure that you're organized and computer literate that's a really important thing to say, isn't it? To be computer literate. I mean, most most departments now they all have their portal for for um, putting through uh, your shopping lists and your payments, etc. But each job you work on, it's all slightly different. But at the end of the day, they all need the same information. It's all about time and money, isn't it? Yeah. 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 That's great. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to move over to George. So George, um, you've been a trainee, you've been a junior, you're now up to artist level and soon to be soon to have your first designing job. Could you tell me the dif the biggest difference between a trainee and junior level to start with? Yeah, sure. So from from my personal experience, moving from a trainee to junior, the most important thing is that you have to remember is that you're still learning um, and as Miriam put really nicely it, it you still have to kind of take part in those administrative tasks but you will be given a lot more responsibility in terms of day players so stunt doubles and, and even on set you'll be expected to go in for checks and you'll have that experience from being a trainee and being around on set and understanding when you need to go in when's the right time to go in um, what you're looking for, et cetera. And also just looking around at, at what your makeup artists around you might need as well. So I think it's kind of a lot, it, there is more responsibility, but that you have to remember that you're technically still learning. I mean, I believe that you'll be, you'll be learning forever. You know, things change all the time. You will always be learning. Um, you know, you'll teach, sometimes I might teach someone something that they, you know, they've been doing it for 30 years and vice versa. You just never know where you're going to learn from, whether that could be a trainee or a junior or an artist. Um, and that confidence as well. I think when you first come in as a trainee, it's very daunting. I remember my first time on set was terrifying because I just thought I don't want to get in the way. I don't know where I'm going. And, you know, you don't initially recognize other departments. Um, so you kind of don't know, you know, there's a couple of times where I've been asked, oh, can you go to the to the people with the iPads? And I just think, what <laughs> what do they look like? <laughs> so, you know, it's just that building on that confidence and that experience. Um, but, yeah, very important that you're still present and helping your trainees um, with extra admin because at the end of the day, we are all working towards the same goal. I um, mean, even as an artist now, I if I see the trainees, overloaded with work yeah I'll come in I'll make some continuity photos for you I'll do whatever you need because we are still a team and I'm you know don't feel like I'm above doing anything that's going to help them personally um and then from junior to artist it is like you said Liz confidence and speed and I think a lot of it is being able to think on your feet because things can change so quickly I remember when I was on Enola Holmes uh, it was just me on the makeup bus and I was doing a stunt double um, and I got a, a message through on WhatsApp saying, oh, by the way, he's been he's been stabbed in the hand with a pen. And no one knew this. It wasn't in the script. It wasn't anywhere. We had nothing to do with someone who's been stabbed in the hand with a pen. So I had to paint it on with just flat makeup and just try and make it look 3D as much as possible. And I think I had about five minutes and we also had no, you know, there was no blood because at this point there was no blood in the script. There was nothing. Um, and the one bottle of blood we had was on set with Millie. So, um, yeah, it was just like thinking on your feet and being able to kind of stay calm through that as well is really important. Um, so, yeah. And, and just knowing where things are on set. Um, and, and also I think your knowledge of, of, of periods as well. So we do so much period work over here in, in the UK. Um, and I think it sets you apart when someone can just say a period and, and something pops straight into your head of, oh, okay, I know what that looks like, whether it's like a facial hair or, you know, a big hairstyle or just men's hair in general. So I think, yeah, it's just knowledge. And, and the difference between a, a junior and artist, I think is just what I like to refer to as mileage. You know, I got my driver's license when I was a trainee and now I'm just driving and driving and driving and getting to that point where I'm confident enough that I could, you know, think on my feet 
and do whatever is, is asked of me at that point. Brilliant. Um, so as far as key skills and qualities or even qualifications are concerned, what mm -hmm. do you think the people who are watching us today, listening to us today, what would you say are those key things that they need to concentrate on? Um, I would say a, a big thing in terms of skill now is 100% barbering and haircutting. Um, you know, it, set, it definitely sets you apart. The last job that I did, both juniors were kind of fully qualified barbers. And a lot of the time the juniors were doing all the haircuts. Um, you know, when there's times offset where we've got cast members coming in who need haircuts and all the other artists are on set with people who they're looking after that day. Um, you know, it fell to the juniors to do things even like perms on wigs and stuff like that. Um, if you can get salon experience with colouring, perms or cutting, it really would set you apart. Um, even from a trainee level, if you can cut hair, it's absolutely vital, I think, now. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably my main my main thing. Um, and in terms of qualities, I think it's really important that you're just kind of a, a teachable person. If you're curious and teachable, a lot of the time when I've spoken to designers or they've um, asked me to look for trainees or juniors to come in and help us, they've said, you know, I don't mind necessarily if they're not at the top of their game. If they're a nice person and they are teachable, I would much rather that and help, you know, be able to teach someone. Um, and I think it's, yeah, being personable is, is super important. Because, you, you know, we spend so much time together and um, basically you end up seeing the people you work with more than your own family and your friends. So if you get along, it makes everything so much easier. And also you don't get the chance as a trainee and junior level to show off your craft skills in the same way as the artists do. So the way that you prove to people how professional you are is through your soft skills and through your etiquette you know the etiquette of being on set and working as a team yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah so you know people leaving college and graduating what advice would you give them to make them more visible to potential employers um one of the main things that i find that i end up looking at is i have a lot of people especially coming from either um, who will message me on Instagram and just kind of almost introduce themselves to me um, and make themselves known. And, and a lot of the time in, in that instance, I will follow them back. But I think one of the main things I notice is watching people practice, whether it's on a dolly head or on a member of their family, if they're posting about that quite a few times, I have, have, have seen that and gone, oh, wow, that's really nice, actually. And then it stays in my brain for, for if somebody asks me, or do you know a trainee or a junior that could do this? So I think social media is a huge part of it now, massive. There's so many Instagram pages that are kind of posting about people who are available. Um, and you can post yourself and tag those Instagram pages and then they will repost you. And it basically just gets you out there a lot further. But I think it's important to contact people that you would like to work for, whether whether you know they're on a job or not, it's important to kind of stay present in that moment and just keep practicing and posting that because you kind of never know who's looking at it. Um, quite a few times I have reached out to people through Instagram and just because I know I can see what their skills are because they're showing it to me, whether they know they're showing it to me or not, I'm watching it. Um, so I think that's that's a really good way of getting through it and the whatsapp groups as well um i only discovered those not that long ago um and i'm i'm in a lot of those now and you know even i i, I personally have posted jobs in those i've had people come out through the whatsapp group um and it's a really great way of knowing about jobs especially if it's so last minute the amount of times i've been asked oh we need someone tomorrow and they need to COVID test today because this was back during COVID times which made it so much more difficult um because we had to COVID test people before they came in um so yeah it, th those kind of things I think are really important I think social media plays a huge huge role in in work now for us I, I think it's also important to say that if you've got um if you're trying to get hold of people of my generation, we don't use social media in the same way. Sorry, we're old, me and Jackie. <laughs> we don't use social media in the same way, the same but you way. can usually find them. You know, you can 
You can look at um, the Knowledge Online, for example. The Knowledge Online will give you a list of all the productions that are in pre-production, currently shooting, etc. And you have to be a bit of a detective because the makeup designers are not going to be on there going, I'm doing this, this is my email, because they'll just get inundated. So you have to do a little bit of detective work. You will be able to find the production office phone number or email. You might be looking at something which is series four of something that it's already shot three series. 90% chance that it's going to be the same makeup designer. That makeup designer might have an agent. You can get your CV to them through their agent or through the production. So you do have to do a little bit of detective work because it's not like... Um, a job as an accountant where there's a website that all accountants jobs are listed it doesn't really work that way um you you know do as much networking as you possibly can if there are screen skills events or free webinars like this one um bafta do quite a few events but anything in your local area make yourself visible nobody knows you exist so spielberg's not going to be calling you because he doesn't know you exist so you have to put yourself out there so that they know about you um, and if you, you know, if you are good at what you do and you have the right etiquette and the right personality for it, everything else, all those learning your craft skills comes, doesn't it? It comes with experience and time, etc. cetera. Um, so, George, what is your proudest moment and your biggest challenge so far? Um, I've got a lot of proud moments, but I think for me, the, the one that sticks out in my mind was when we won our Emmy for, for Bridgerton for hair um, and being able to watch Mark, my designer, thank me in his Emmy speech. That was a, a surreal moment for me because I was, how old would I have been? 24, I think. And to, to hear my name at that point, it was just, yeah, it's something I will I will never forget ever. And receiving my, my Emmy certificate as well. Um, uh, for contribution to, to the Emmy was pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> um, and as for biggest challenge, I think my biggest challenge, which is also quite a funny one, is when we went out to Sardinia for The Little Mermaid, Peter Swords King, my designer, had assured me I would not be going in the sea at any point and that I could just wear my normal clothes and it would be fine. Um, and that wasn't the case. And um, one day, fully clothed, we had a lot of mermaids in the water who had extremely long wigs and they were just matting um, and knotting up from from just sitting on top of the water and everyone was in there apart from me and Peter and he just looked at me and he said you're gonna have to go in the sea and I was just fully clothed and he just put like some a tail comb some wig glue and a brush in between my fingers and just sent me out into the ocean <laughs> Um, and that's what I did so I was just in there fully clothed and there's nothing I could do about it and it was I mean it, luckily it was beautiful it was about 40 degrees so it's actually quite nice but that was a huge challenge because it, you know they were in quite deep and I'm not very tall so I'm up to here in water with my hands above my head with my tail coat my glue in my hands uh, trying to be helpful so that was a, a huge huge challenge for us. <laughs> Brilliant. So, George, you're about to embark on your first designing job, which, congratulations. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, I feel excited. It, it's it's definitely daunting. Um, I mean, I've worked very closely with, with designers at different levels, whether that's trainee or junior or artist. Um, but it's still daunting to know that it's, it's going to be me. It's going to be kind of my thought process and my designs. Um, it's still very early days, so I have I'm waiting on my script so that I can break down everything, figure out what days I'm going to need people, figure out where I need to budget for certain things um, because there might be some special effects involved. Um, but I'm excited. I'm really excited. I love creating characters, um, especially with a good backstory. I think that's super important. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm anticipating it. <laughs> Brilliant. Really excited for you um so Jackie Jackie yeah. you've probably seen many changes in the different roles during your career could you talk a little bit about um what you feel is the most important thing for people graduating and going into first steps as a trainee I think it's we've all we've all talked about this or you've all talked about this it's it's about being personable it's about being likable it's about being teachable 
it's about wanting to learn I think that's the I think that's the main thing for me. It's like people coming to you wanting to learn and wanting to ask questions. I find it very frustrating when you have a trainee that, you know, they get an opportunity to come and work with you and they come and sit on the bus or, or the truck or the crowd room and they sit in a corner and they don't say anything or they, I understand that it can be very daunting and a scary place sometimes. And there's so many, but you have to be interested and you have to be enthusiastic and you have to be keen to learn. So I think for me, it's like, I want any of my staff to be asking me questions. If they don't know the answer, ask the question, you know, because you, we don't, you know, I don't know what you don't know until you tell me what you don't know. So I think it's, that's, that's the one of the big things for me, learning how to deal with people. I think people skills are probably the, one of the most important things, actually, even more than our creative skills sometimes, because you can be the best makeup artist, but if you're not very personable or you don't get on with people who rub people out the wrong way, your skills aren't going to get shown. Um, and on the flip side of that, you can be a not too great makeup artist and do exceedingly well because your people skills are very good. So for me, it's those. It's come, come with wanting to learn, being prepared to learn, being prepared to be adaptable um, with some knowledge. Because I think, again, it's that thing of, don't come and go I always want to be a makeup artist but you don't know anything about the industry whether that's current things that are on the tv or the or the cinema um have an interesting period if that's what you want to do obviously you don't want to do period you want to do modern day you want to do fashion but then even then I think even in modern day and fashion you'll hark, you'll watch them harking back to period and stuff you know even the Pat McGrath stuff at the minute there's lots of finger waving and you know it's modern but if you don't know what a finger wave is you don't know where it comes from that you kind of need to have some knowledge. It's only when you say to people about black and white films and you have somebody go, who's that? You know, who's this person? Who's, you can't know everything. We can't all know everything, but you can have an interest at least in what, you're, what, you're, what you want your craft to be. It's about immersing yourself, isn't it? I mean, I know we've all got Google at our fingertips, but if you're standing opposite a director or an actor and they say to you, I want a Clark Gable moustache, and you don't know what that, you can't stand and Google that in front of the director, because that's just embarrassing. You need to know what a Clark Gable moustache is. I mean, if somebody said to you a Marilyn Monroe hairstyle, we all know what that is, because we should all know who that is. But there's a lot of these people throughout history that a director or an actor or an actress is going to say an iconic look. So it's about immersing yourself in the history of it and, uh, uh, you know, and the love of it. Um, watching as much stuff as possible. And that's not just Barbie and Wonka. It's from years ago. You know, know who the big makeup designers are today in TV and film. Know who the big fashion makeup designers are, but also know who they were in the 80s, 70s, 60s, et cetera, et cetera. And how the... Um, progression of things like prosthetics, how that has moved on massively um, in the last 20 years, actually, with the advent of silicon and, and, and now with digital. You know, we, we teach a lot of um, 3D scanning and digital printing, 3D printing in our prosthetics bit now, because that is the way the industry is going. Uh, it will, it will happen because we know that happens. Technology will do what it can do um but from as far as people always say to me what's going to happen to our departments with the digital the glam squad will always be the glam squad <laughs> we'll always be here those actors want us there they need us there um and even the um the film called here that has just been shot here at pinewood with tom hanks and they've done a lot of the uh, it's not aging it's youthening of Tom Hanks they've done it digitally and you, you can look this up on online and see how they've done it but they still needed the makeup team to do as much as they possibly could to for the cameras to be able to take over and they can't do hair so it's really important moving forward in this digital age to do hair because the computers can't do hair it's not solid enough <laughs> Really, really well. So, Jackie, I know you and I have spoke. Jackie and I trained together back in 1984, um, and we spoke about, yeah, sorry, uh, we spoke about our teams and when we're working, how we like our teams to work. And every department will work differently. They will have the, the general role of trainee, junior artist, etc. 
but you all work differently. Can you just explain how your departments work, Jackie? I think I think it depends on the size of the production. I think that's the other thing. I think the bigger productions you do, it's almost the the smaller role you have. You know, the bigger production is all divided amongst everybody, and you have lots of trainees and lots of juniors, and you know you won't be packing up and you won't be doing this and you won't be doing that. And the smaller a team gets or the smaller production gets, the more work you do. So if you're on main team or if you're on a truck, you know you're doing a lot more than just doing the the admin. I mean, I've always kind of, we've had this conversation, this part of me thinks it's quite wrong that my most junior members of trainees or juniors are doing all the paperwork because you kind of go, I think that's quite a big responsibility and that's something as a designer or as a trainee, when I started off, that wasn't, you didn't get to do that. You know, you wouldn't get to look at the continuity folder or, or deal with those kind of call sheets. You'd be told where to go and what you were doing. Whereas now I think you do have to be a lot more across all of that. And as you said, Miriam, you find that people come to you and ask you where you're meant to be and where, what you're meant to be doing rather than going to the designer. It used to be that it was the designer that had all the answers, you know, but often, yes, we should have all the answers. But at the same time, you're the ones that have been given that information. You're on the floor because sometimes the designer doesn't even get to the floor. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a designer that likes to be on the floor. I like to see what's going on. I don't like getting that shock of watching something back that I've worked on and that's not how I set something up or that's not how I establish something. So I quite like being on the floor as much as I can, but I know there's lots of other designers don't even come off the truck, some of them. You know, so I think every job is different and every designer is different. Um, every So every role is different. Every time you, you can have this basic idea of what you're going to be doing, but you, as we talked about before, you have to be adaptable because it can change at the drop of a hat. And what one person likes, somebody else might not. I mean, how many times have you been told that you block the wig this way or you wrap a block that way and you go on your next job and they go, oh, you don't wrap a block like that. You do it this or you don't put your pins at an angle, you put them in straight. You know, unfortunately, all of us designers have our idiosyncrasies of what we like and, and how we like to do something. At the same time, as you also said, Georgia, I can learn from my trainee or my junior daily because they have skills that I don't have. My computer skills, to be fair, are pretty ropey. And my daughters will attest to that because I go and go, how do I work this? How do I work that? So having a young team is brilliant because they can do the continuity and they can do the paperwork and they can find this and they can... Google that and they can set up Zoom when I've pressed the wrong button and deleted myself. Um, so we all have our part to play. And I think that's really important. I don't believe anybody should be too big for their boots. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're at the top or the bottom. We all play an important part and we're all a vital cog in a very big production and a very big wheel. So whether it is getting the teas or the coffees or the lunches, I can guarantee you that's probably one of the most important roles on the truck to make sure everybody else is fed and watered. You only have an hour if you're lucky, if you're not doing checks and you're not traveling back. So for somebody to have gone off and got your lunch, it's probably more important than, you know, making sure you've got your main bag, but it is important. And don't leave on the back of the bus or in the truck or on set in vision. <laughs> so One yeah, thing that I think we there's... haven't covered that I'm very aware that we haven't covered because we might have people who are interested in other departments is how closely we work with other departments, how closely we work obviously with costume, with lighting, yeah. with the designer and director together to create the look. Do you yeah. want to just talk a little bit about that collaborative process from prep Absolutely. through to shooting? I think, I think even especially on period stuff, I think I think on modern day stuff, it's kind of it, it is as collaborative and you do have those conversations but I think when you're talking about period stuff I think it's vitally important um, especially with your costume designer because you're talking about if you're talking about wigs or we're talking about hair often you know if they're outside every person has a hat male or female so you often have to decide design your hairstyles around the hats you're going to be wearing or the hats they're going to be giving you or often you'll be in a crowd room and you'll be given a hat and it won't work <laughs> with the hairstyle you've just created. So you can have to go back and say, you know, is it possible to change this hat? Is it possible to rearrange this hat? Because sometimes you can't change the hair depending on what the, the hair is that you've got to work with. Um, other times you can, if you've got pieces and wigs or sometimes you can change them. Um, directors, for me, I think it's, 
you know, you can, as a designer, you can have a vision of what you would like, but ultimately it's what the director wants and we're there to facilitate him or them, her. Um, and if you are really fastidious about an idea that you have, then you might need to use your soft skills <laughs> to try and adapt them and try and make them work. Or they might not be aware that the actress that you have is really quite quirky or has an issue. I don't know, for example, maybe your actress has got really big ears and they don't want all their hair scraped back, but that is the period. Um, and you maybe have to try and adapt that slightly to cheat it, to make it functional for the period, to keep your artist happy, to keep your director happy. Um, so I think there's a lot of those things. Lighting, again, if you have, and you probably know this, Georgie, it's like you can have a black eye that works perfectly every time, and then you get it on set. Like today, you can see it's really, really bright. So the black eye that you've done isn't gonna look the same for it being in a dark room or you know a shadowy room so you might have to go in heavier and, and darken it down and make it heavier and add more blood or take the shine off because this light's hitting it you know wig lace and lights formidable as ever you know trying to lose wig lace and with lighting and how often do they go and give you the key light and it's hitting you right here on the wig lace you're like, can you not just cheat it back a little bit or you have a lighting cameraman that will say, or DOP go, can you move that hat back? That hat's creating too much of a shadow. And they're not prepared to give you a fill light. So you've got to cheat the hat back, even though every shot it's been tilted down like this, you know? So it's so it, we could sit here all day and talk about the times and things you've had to change stuff. Or, you know, you I don't know, somebody comes into the crowd and they've got gel nails on and it's period. And you have to go to Cosmo, can you give me gloves? Because I can't get them off or they come with lash extensions, you know, all of the, all of these things. Um, yeah, we could write a book about all of the yeah. things you have to collaborate with and have to sometimes try and make work on the day. But again, as I said, I generally believe it's about teamwork and none of us can do our job without anybody else, any other department, you know, so we will have to be there and we have to work and adapt together and make it as pleasant as possible. Yeah, working as a team is so important, isn't it? I mean, yeah. from the minute you start prepping, which is the designer's job, and you sit around a table with all the heads of department, yeah. to when you're actually shooting on set, and as the makeup artist is there with that actor, getting the, that actor perfect for that shot, so is the costume department, and Absolutely. so is the props department. And you're all in there doing final checks, which are moments before you start shooting, but you have to be... Um, you have to be humble and be aware that everyone else has got to do their job as well. It's not just about you. And that actor has got to act. They might be shooting a really difficult scene. So, you know, you have to be empathetic to the emotions of the actor and not go in and start fussing with them if it's not necessary. But you have to make sure yeah. they look right for the part. So there's there's so much involved in the process of collaborating to make this piece of art all come together. So there's, yeah. there's times, you know, you mentioned it there, there's times you have to forgo doing your checks. If you've got an actor and you can see that this is just not the right time, it's not the right time for you to go in and move that little bit of hair. You know, lots of people don't think are important when you're watching it, but you know for a fact that it's not going to cut the same, or it's not going to edit the same. But at that time, you have to make a decision about what's more important, the continuity or the fact that that artist is going to get the performance out because the director is going to be more more interested in the performance than that little bit of hair. Um, on the flip side of that, there's also crucial times when you kind of go, no, that bit of hair needs to be there because it's continuity or it's written or um, for whatever reason. So it's about, yeah, picking your battles, I think, mm. and decide which ones are the important ones. And, yeah. some, uh, of, some of the yeah. hardest ones, Jackie, I'm sure you'll agree, is where you see and it's written in the script and we see the tear roll down her cheek and you just think, yay, that's going to take a bit of shooting because by the yeah. time we get to that close up of the tear, she's probably yeah. all teared out, right? Teared <laughs> out, exactly. Or they've, you know, they've done, they've done, the, they've done the wide and they've had tears down tear and then they go in and they want the end of it, all of the, all, the, all of the above. All of yeah. the above, or you yeah. sometimes you just yeah. hope you've got an actress that can cry, or you know, then you have other actresses that by the time you've gone through half a tear stick, or, or you know, they've then got red eyes, and you're then trying to create this lovely one tear wonder, and they're squinting because they've had so much tear stick that they can't actually see any longer. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, so um, we spoke a little bit with Georgia about social media. Um, and when you're working on a production of a certain caliber, you have to sign yeah. an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, which means you cannot say anything. You cannot take photographs and you cannot post anything until the film has or production has aired. Um, can you talk a little bit about that for us, Jackie, and how important that yeah. is? I think it's really important. We were actually, um, I can't I can actually talk about this actually, because it's not even going out now. We were, I wasn't designing it. I was in the crowd room. We were filming on Batgirl, which has now been shelved and got, gone out. Um, and it was meant to be this big um, ball sequence and all of these characters were dressed in these specific costumes. And one of the supporting artists actually took a photograph of herself, posted it on social media. And it was like repercussions went through the whole of the unit because it was quite a crucial part to the story. She was sacked. She was sacked there and then. Um, but also it was just so naive because they were, they were all told that you shouldn't be taking photographs and you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. Um, the same storylines for programmes. And when we were told... Not, not in the same vein in, with a big thing. We've just been doing Gladiators, the TV show. We weren't allowed to post anything about any of those characters because they wanted it to be this big launch. The first thing they were going to see them was on these days and those days. And they have a whole, most, most production companies almost, they have a, a process of how they want to put that information out about the film and the story. And you don't want to be given that little bit of, you don't want somebody to be taking a photograph of a little bit of a snippet of where you of that story and where it's going to be even to the fact of we're not even allowed to post where you're filming because you don't want hordes of people rocking up we're doing outlander again i don't design that but when we're doing outlander you don't the call sheets are like gold dust you they've got your names watermarked on them because so that if anything gets leaked they know who to pass it back to um they don't want crowds and crowds and crowds of fans on set causing aggro um, if they don't want it. So it's very, very important that you, I mean, how often, you know, it's like Liz, you have photos and photos and photos that you've taken on set. You can't publish them sometimes for two, three, three years later until it's been put out. And then by which time you've actually forgotten you've worked on that job half the time. You think, oh, I should really be doing a bit of social advertising here and putting out pictures of stuff that I've done. You're onto your next job and you've moved on to your other thing and, so yeah, I kind of, how many times you told not to have your phone on set, although half the time you're having to use that to do your continuity and you're having to use it for your pages or for your screenshots. But yeah, not not to take photographs of actors and people unless they, um, one, if they, they approve and two, the production aren't gonna haul you over the coals for it. So yeah, be careful. I think the best, the best way of being is you can promote yourself on social media but if in doubt, just don't don't say it, don't do it, because we're used to it here. We're at Pinewood Studios and they have tracking software on all social media. So as soon as anything comes out, really? nobody's allowed to take a photo, even walking down the, you know, the, the driveways. You're not allowed to. Um, and so do all the, the, big, the big films, you know, and anything like Outlander. There's a lot of press that rolled around it and they want to be in control of that. And as soon as Absolutely. somebody leaks it, they're no longer in control of it. So it's a big deal. It is, you know, it's 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 a big deal to them. Um, well, could you? I know you you work on a lot of period drama, but you also work on light entertainment. What's the difference in the working patterns and hours um, for those different kind of jobs, Jackie? Well, as you well know, well, there aren't really any working patterns and hours, are there? <laughs> as such, we um, if you're filming, you. Normally, a normal filming day would be, you know, you turn over at eight o'clock and you wrap at seven with an hour for lunch, if you're lucky. That depends whether it's on continuous working days, semi-continuous working days. Um, you, you could have half an hour prep and wrap. You could have three hours, you know, prep, depends on, on, the, on the job. Um, I think studio and light entertainment is a little bit more... I'm not going to say civilized. It isn't really. It depends on is that then your studios could be ten to ten. You could be doing a twelve hour day. Our normal days are twelve hours minimum, probably unless you're doing a, a continuous working day. And I think most people in this, most people in the industry haven't don't really think about how long our days are. And people talk about oh, a working week, nine to five. 
five days a week, 40 hours, you're like that. You've probably done that in two or three days, you know? So, um, our yeah, lots of hours. But I also think for me, I, I enjoy it. I mean, I've always enjoyed it. And I think you have to be a bit of a glutton for punishment, I think, sometimes. You know, it's that this nine to five nonsense. I'm kind of going, really? But five o'clock, you're thinking about you've still got three or four hours to go and you know, you're on set. In Scotland, it's a bit different because often it's very dark. So our shooting days can often be early because they need to get stuff shot before it gets dark. Um, stu uh, lighting studio wise, you don't have a makeup room. You're not normally on a truck. Uh, I think when we did Gladiators, we had audiences of 10,000 or something. We were in arenas. So that was and that's live TV. So you have an absolute strict deadline of you start shoot. You know, you start turning over when you start turning over. I think there's a little bit more flexibility on set and on location but again not always you've got a first ad that's wanting to it to run on time and you're trying to get stuff shot you're not going to complete anything unless you work to a schedule so i think yeah i don't know if that answered your question or not i think i might have yes it did thank you very much i have got some <laughs> questions from um the attendees this one i actually think georgia this is a good one for you to answer um are there opportunities to work in special effects only yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I did a job earlier this year, which I can't say what it was. Um, but we had a whole separate prosthetics team, which worked completely separately as a department from hair and makeup. Um, so absolutely, and they had their own trainees, their own juniors, their own continuity, completely separate, um, as well as workshop opportunities. I think. Getting into a workshop, you know, I see advertisements all the time for people like Christian Mallet, um, KMFX, who are looking for workshop trainees or people who sculpt and things like that, which is a completely yeah. different. Oh, <laughs> um, so yeah, you absolutely can just go into prosthetics. I think sometimes, initially, when I started the job, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do prosthetics. I've never touched hair. Um, and hair terrified me, um, but I quickly changed my mind. And, and since coming out, since I graduated from IVA, pretty much every job I did was all period hair. So it was the polar opposite of what I thought I was gonna be doing. And then I slowly got into doing more prosthetics after that. But I think it's sometimes it's important to make sure you have all those skills. Even if you then want to specialize in prosthetics, that's fine. But I think having those skills of, of hair and makeup as well, because, you know, it's one of those things of they could go to prosthetics and they could have prosthetics put on. And then I might have to lay over hair over the top of that. So we have to be able to work together. So it's important to know kind of how, you know, if you're only prosthetics, that they still cross over quite a lot. And if you've got a full face of prosthetics and then a wig has to go on, you know, or you're putting makeup on, it, there's a lot, there's a lot that they kind of cross over. So I think it's still important to have, those three skills at the start but absolutely you can just do prosthetics absolutely thank you um Miriam this is a question for you I think would be a good one what things should you should they be thinking of doing when they're not working um I think when you're not working firstly don't be disheartened because there are going to be quiet periods especially when you're starting out um and it can seem a bit daunting and overwhelming but I think if you if you just keep working on um your practical skills so whether that's on friends and family um or on dolly heads and try and work on as many faces as possible and build your confidence um but also work on your cv work on your cover letter work on um have like admin days where you're doing your research and looking online or even if you're just watching those of tv and film and just really thinking about what it is about the hair and makeup that stands out to you and and maybe even like looking at a picture of a hairstyle online and trying to figure out maybe like how they created that um I know there's loads of good books as well um on like wig dressing or on um, special effects and um, try practicing that but I think the main thing is just try and focus on like what the fact that you're passionate about it and 
um, don't get discouraged and disheartened um, if there are quiet periods. And the more you do, the more confident that you'll feel. Thank you. Um, there's, I know that we're concentrating on high-end TV and film today, but you mustn't forget that there, there's work in theatre, there's work in um, fashion, photography, e-commerce, private clients and all this thing you can earn money at you know I've because we've had an actor strike last year a lot of my graduates I've been pointing them towards theatre obviously if you're in a big city you're going to have theatres there it's the same skills it's the same job and you're getting your skills up you're getting your speed and your confidence up so don't just wait for Disney to be calling you there's all these other routes that you are doing the job you're trained to do and getting paid for it. Um, so I've got a few more questions uh, here. Sorry, was somebody going to answer that? Yeah, I was just going to say also, it's like, don't also go, oh, I don't do theatre, because funnily enough, I've had two shows of my TV shows have actually gone to theatre that we've actually done, we've been on tour with. So I've been on a tour bus like Marilyn Monroe and um, in a little bunkle uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, with and having to try and then take so we we did um we did something called Grandpa's Great Escapes, which was a David Williams film, TV film that we did as a Christmas. Um, and they then did it as a a theatre show, a theatre tour, which we then had to we had then had to adapt it and take it on on tour. So the original character, one of the original characters I did was actually with Jennifer Saunders, where she played two characters and has to reveal herself as a woman to a man. We had to then adapt for theatre for it to work in a live action repeat day in and day out. So again, theatre is a great way to go and learn and hone those skills as well. So as you say, Liz, don't just go, I only do TV or film. Theatre is a brilliant, brilliant place to go and hone those skills as well. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I'll just add on that. I did some theatre as well after graduating. I worked on a couple of shows and I think when you're first starting out, it's really, really good because you tend to be a bit more hands-on in theatre than you are when you first go into TV and film as a trainee. Um, so it is really, really helpful to help with your speed. I mean, you usually start getting people ready an hour, 45 minutes before, and you've got 17 people to get ready in that time. So um, it is really good with speed and also with working with wigs and, and blocking up wigs. Um, obviously, there's differences with film lace and theatre lace, but in terms of like working on your confidence and your skill, it's really really good and it's fun <laughs> yeah actually um Miriam you can answer this this is a question from Helen in terms of wig blocking and creating wigs does that need to be a skill you need to have before being a trainee um I think you definitely should know how to block a wig and and um be able to handle the wig lace because um often as a trainee you might be asked to do that however I did have going back to those two films last year that I've been talking about and the first one um, they were very happy for me to block all of the wigs and and clean all the wigs and do that. But on the second one, they didn't want me to block the wigs until someone showed me how to do it, even though they know I've blocked wigs in the past, but it's because they had a specific way that they wanted me to do it. So I would never just go in and, and take the wig and do it. I'd always ask if they're happy for me to block it. Um, but I would say that is definitely a useful skill to have. In terms of creating wigs is that um styles or actually making a wig uh, i i would think it's probably the the creating the style so it's, yeah. it's down, always down to the designer to create that style isn't it yeah exactly i think that just comes back to what i was saying before where you're just trying to practice creating different styles same as you would on a head um but instead on a wig but again you just need to be careful of the fact like I I guess you just need to be more mindful of the fact that there's wig lace there and you have to be careful that you're not catching it and ripping it and again in order you need to block up the wig in order to do the style on the wig. Um, Jackie there's um, the, a question here specifically for you uh, when you're talking about how designers might like things a certain way how would you go about knowing that and what questions would you be asking? I think I'm, I'm trying to get out my, my son's coming through my living room. I think it's 
a designer will like something a certain way, their team will know how they like that that certain way as well. So you don't have to ask the designer. If the designer is one of those people that doesn't like to be bothered with those little questions, the rest of their team will know because they'll know how they like that done. So whether that is a block, whether 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 that's using tape, no tape, lots of pins, you know, we all have we all have different ways. Normally, normally it's the way you've been trained, to be honest, but sometimes it's also the way that you like or you had you because you're trying to protect you know what the budget is i think what i was going to try what i was going to say to you before was i think it's very important not that i think you need to be able to not i think it's great if you do i think it's a really good thing to know what's actually involved in how long it takes to make a wig how the fact that most of those hairs are put in individually i think you gain more respect for a wig i think it's a lot of people not all but I think, you know, there's been trainees that have come on that don't have that respect because they don't realise how valuable that little piece of ball of net and hair is or how long it takes or how long, how, how difficult it is to rep replace or to repair. So I think if you have that bit of a knowledge, it makes you value those pieces you've got. You know, how many times have you seen somebody going to take a wig and they're about to dip it in a bowl of water rather than blocking it or they haven't blocked it right or if it's not been knotted correctly and the roots and the points aren't all facing the same way that it's going to go into this great big ball and then the trainee is going to, have to be sitting there at the end trying to get it all out you know i think that kind of knowledge is you know is, is, is irreplaceable you need to know that weather as well can screw wigs up outland a prime example by the time all of your principles come back in or any of your extras come back in this back bit of their hair is like one big knotted mass because it's all been rubbing on their collars and you need to know how to look after those. So it's not always, it's not always all just about the lace. It's about everything else and managing it and making sure that it's blocked correctly. So you don't get bagging and stretching and distorting of the shapes. There's quite a few questions that I'm going, that are about courses and what courses to recommend both for Afro, Afro hair courses, wig courses, please do look at the Ivor Academy website. Our All our courses are um, screen skills recognised. And if you are upskilling, that means you're already a working makeup artist. Um, there's a possibility you could get a bursary from screen skills to help fund any upskilling courses. So please do look at that. I won't ask answer all the individual questions about courses. Um, uh, would you recommend any platforms or apps to find creative industry work? I think we kind of covered that, Georgia, didn't we, with social, the different social media? Yeah, definitely. Instagram is definitely a big one. Um, I'm in a lot of Facebook groups as well, um, which is, I suppose, considered a little bit more old school now. Uh, but Instagram, Facebook, um, there's a lot of fashion work that goes through Facebook groups, Um and, and WhatsApp groups as well. There's definitely there's also regional WhatsApp groups. I think there's different ones for like London, um, Bath and Bristol, there's a different one. Um, and then I expect the same with Scotland and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot on there. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's one question here for prosthetics. Are there any books that you would recommend for human anatomy that have good quality images? I know we've got loads on our bookshelf, but I wouldn't be able to read yeah. all the names of them, I'm afraid. <laughs> I can there always... Is, there is one thing though that I would say is worth going to see, which I did. They, there's an exhibition of um, real human anatomy and it's all okay. real bodies. I think it might just be called Bodies. It was in London not that long ago. And it might sound a little bit gruesome, but it honestly isn't. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like that at all, but it's incredible to see like the whole nervous system of a body in front of you is incredible. But if that is anywhere near you at any point, go and see it. It's a hundred percent worth it. I, th I think also we were old school. We used to, we used to do medical journals, actually going and looking at medical journals um, and getting those from either old ones from old, you know, old, um, old libraries or old bookshops or anything like that there's because there's really good photographs because they're you know these people are training to be surgeons so you can actually find old medical journals in sort of historical bookshops and stuff like that um 
yeah, pretty gruesome. I wouldn't sort of, if you... <laughs> You've got to be a little bit careful with Google because it's difficult to know whether it's primary reference or secondary reference. So obviously that means yeah. primary reference means it's the real thing. Secondary reference means a makeup artist has created it. Absolutely. So it's difficult to tell with Google sometimes if it's a good makeup yeah. artist. Um, medical, I think medical. we have managed to answer all of the questions in the group and we are now... Um, yeah, I think we're getting close to the end. I just want to say a huge thank you to um, Miriam, George and Jackie for today. Miriam, if you've got one final bit of advice for people starting off, what would it be? Um, I think say yes to everything, um, to every opportunity that comes your way. Like don't don't fail yourself like just thinking oh I don't know if I can do that give yourself the opportunity to try and always ask questions um don't let yourself feel like you're drowning in work or or that you're completely out of your depth people are nice generally nice and are happy to help you and um I think the more that you're open and honest about your abilities the further you'll get absolutely and George, final final bits of advice for the viewers. Um, I would just say enjoy it. There are definitely going to be days where you are cold and you are wet and you are very tired and you're a little bit grumpy, but you'll look back on that job when it's finished and you won't remember that. You'll remember everything that you enjoyed about that job and you'll miss the family, the little family that you made on that job. So yeah, try and enjoy it even if you're in really difficult circumstances at that point. And Jackie, can you remember that far back? I can, I can remember leaving college yes. and how daunting it was. Final yeah. bits of but advice. Do, I do not, I'm trying, but I kind of go, there's, I was, we were talking about it funnily enough the other day, it's one of my first ever jobs at the BBC was Tutti Fruity. And sadly, John Byrne recently passed away and they had they've been doing reruns of it on the telly and you know there's still friends I made on that job I was a trainee on that job there's still friends I made on that job are still my friends and we still talk about it and I think this the good jobs and the bad jobs you'll always have stories to tell and you'll always make some really 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 good friends and I think yeah we've been doing it 40 years now Liz Ooh. and uh <laughs> and we still talk about it you know we still talk about it with fondness and very rarely is there something that's maybe that unhappy that I was miserable. And to be honest, they I could probably count them on one hand and they don't matter because there's not that many of them. So just enjoy it. I think it's just also enjoy. important to remember as artists, we will all get our moments with imposter syndrome. However many Emmys or BAFTAs or jobs you've been asked back, we all have that moment of oh my God, the work I've just done, what of it, it looks awful. We all have that because we're artistic and artistic people are more sensitive. So we're more prone to that. So keep that in mind. If you're having a wobble and you're feeling you've lost some confidence, just remember that we all feel like that and keep going. It's a fantastic career to have. You know, I'm the other end of my career after 40 years, you are just starting out. It's absolutely fantastic. And it's every day is different on set. Every job is different. And the people you meet, I count myself so lucky to have had the career that I've had and continue to have. Um, I really hope this has been helpful and informative for you all. And I hope that if you all are ever in Pinewood Studios, you come and say hello to us here at the IVA. Um, I wish you all well at the start of your career. Um, have a fantastic journey and good luck. I think I'll hand back over to Victoria if she's still there. Hi, everyone. Thank you ever so much. I hope you really enjoyed that. And I think that's been a really useful session for everybody. Thank you and all the very best of your careers. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you all soon. Bye now.